Good morning, family. If you have your Bible, you can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, Such a blessing to be here. So filled, so blessed. A time of worship is so amazing how you can worship God in every tongue. To think of heaven, how all of us will be there together, different nations, different tongues, all worshiping our Lord, our God, and His Son all together in unison. What a, what a beautiful taste of that. Uh, such a blessing to be here. I've known Pastor Josh for quite a few years. I've known his pastor, uh, Pastor Ken, since I was a child. So it's, uh, it's incredible to be here, to be able to share God's Word with you. You have already shared so much with me. I feel so filled already. And uh, it is so important as Eutychus is going to another area, another church, so important Uh, to be able to be connected with the family of God. Everywhere you go, to be connected with the family of God. It's a lifeline for us. It's so vital and so important. But let's go ahead and we'll read our text, and then we will pray. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, it says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we ask that you would bless our time together. Lord, thank you for being here with us and among among us. And now we just pray, Lord, that you'd bless the teaching of your word and the opening of your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd fill me afresh and anew. Uh, Apart from you, I can do nothing, Lord. And I pray that you'd fill all of the people here, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. May you cut us to the heart. May you convict us and encourage us, Lord. So we just love you. We thank you, Jesus. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Here in 2 Timothy, Paul is writing his last words to his son in the faith, Timothy. And if you have a short time with someone that you love and someone that you care about, you want to make it count. You want it to make sure that you have special words, words of meaning, words of substance, not just frivolous talk about football or hobbies or things like that. And here Paul He's in prison knowing he's going to be executed soon. Knowing that very soon he's going to be beheaded because of his faith and love and teaching of Jesus Christ. And here on death row, here awaiting his execution, he's encouraging his son in the faith. And he tells him, I charge you therefore... Those words, I charge you, it's as if Paul is pulling Timothy into a courtroom and Timothy has to stand before God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son and Paul is giving a very special testimony to Timothy. So important for Timothy, he charges him. This testimony has great weight and great importance. He needs Timothy to realize This is the most important thing for a man of God and for a pastor. And if it's the most important thing for a pastor and a man of God, then we God's people, this is what we should be looking for in churches that we attend. We should be looking for churches not that have great programs or great children's facilities or have great coffee. We should be searching for churches that have great Bible teaching because this is the most important thing. Paul tells Timothy that one day God, Jesus Christ, will judge. 
He will judge all of us and he mentions at his appearing and his kingdom. Even though Paul knows that his life is about to end, he still lives in the hope of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Paul lived with a constant desire for the rapture, a constant readiness for Jesus to come and to take his church home. And those that have this hope, it purifies us. It keeps us from sin. To know that at any moment Jesus can come and take us home, it should cause us to live in more holiness and in less sin. And then he tells them in verse 2, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Family, God's word is so powerful. It's so powerful. It's the only thing that can sustain us and feed us spiritually. It's so important for us to take a, take a, a step back and realize there is nothing else in this life that can feed our soul. Nothing else in this life can feed our soul except the Word of God. And yet we are usually so slow to go to God's Word. When we're feeling sad, we go to a friend. When we're bored, we go to YouTube or social media. We go to our phones. When we're sick, we should look at things online. How do I get better from what I have? How we should turn to God's Word sooner and sooner. That word preach, it's the word to proclaim as a herald for the king. A herald is simply the king's official announcer and a king's official messenger. And what would the herald go out and say for the king? Only what the king has spoken to him. Only what the king has written down for him to share with all of the people. The herald could not add anything to the king's message. The herald couldn't take anything away from the king's message. The herald would be put to death if he interfered with the simple message of the king. The chief concern, what the herald was worried about, was not what the hearers thought. It's not if the hearers would be in a good mood or a bad mood after he shared the king's message. He wasn't worried if they accepted or did not accept the king's message. The only job of the herald was to truly represent his king and to rightly share the message of the king. And for us today, we have a king. Hopefully you have a king. His name is Jesus. And he has given us a message. He has written down his word for us. And his word has everything that pertains to life and godliness. And his word is what we need to be proclaiming to the world around us. In the Old Testament and in the New, there are warnings to not add to God's word. And there are warnings to not subtract from God's word. The idea that God loves those who love themselves. God helps those who help themselves. These are not found in scripture. It's just adding to scripture. The idea that because God loves me, he's going to do everything I want and give me all of my desires, it's not found in Scripture. We need to stick to the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, You shall not add to the Word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Sometimes we receive God's word and we try to add to it so that we don't feel as bad for being disobedient to God's word. We need to take God's word for the truth of what it is. It's the simplest and best way to live. At the end of the book, in Revelation 22, there's also a warning. Revelation 22, verse 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. There are great warnings for us today. And those false teachers out in Eldoret, those false teachers in Miami where I'm from, they are everywhere. One day they will have to answer for adding and subtracting from God's word. We also have to preach God's word in its right context. 
I don't know if you've ever been taken out of context. You tell your children, after you clean your room, after you clean the house, then we'll go get ice cream. Then your child goes and tells the other children, we're going to get ice cream, right? They took you out of context. And now the message is askewed, it's twisted. We need to preach God's word in its proper context. That's why we read verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Taking God at his word and not out of context. We need to look at the setting in which the verse appears. A very famous one is Philippians 4.13. I'm sure many of you know that verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that verse mean? Does it mean that I can outrun, I can be faster than everybody else? Does it mean I can bench press or push more weight than anybody else? Does it mean I can fight someone in a boxing ring and beat them better than anyone else? Not at all. What Paul's saying there is I can learn to be content in being poor and I can learn to be content with great riches. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to take word, it is proper context, where the passage is in its cultural environment and in the historical environment where the scripture was found. We must preach God's word with intelligence. We live in a day and age when many teachers are teaching God's word with only emotion. It's only emotion. That's why they need music in the background while they're teaching. That's why they try to rile up the crowd and get them excited because it's based on emotion. It's not based on the truth of God's word. There, there's no doubt we need emotion involved. Emotion is the seasoning that God has given us to add to our lives. However, for dinner, we don't just sit down and eat bowls of seasoning. It, it would be disgusting. It would destroy our stomachs. We need to add that emotion to our lives, but our lives need to be found on the word of God. Context, proper context. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he warns of churchgoers for long of history rise up because men and women forget the principle of proper context. And this is where all heresy comes from. This is where all false teaching comes from. They take God's word and they take it out of its context. If they had only taken the time to read the right context, they would have been saved from the error that they had embraced. We have to be careful that we are not embracing errors and lies. Look at the full context of God's word. And Paul had been reminding Timothy about the word of God over and over and over again. We find it several times in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, he tells him, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. In chapter 1, verse 13, he tells him to hold fast to the pattern of sound words. In chapter 2, verse 2, he tells him, The things you've heard from me, commit this to other faithful men. In chapter 2, verse 15, he tells him to rightly divide the word of God. In chapter 2, verse 24, he tells him a servant of the Lord must be able to teach. And finally, in chapter 3, verse 16, I encourage you to, to read this together. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he tells us all scripture is given, for, by, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to stick to the Word of God. God's Word is enough. God's Word is enough in your life. God's Word is enough in my life, and God's Word is the very breath of God. Many of us today would say, I wish God would open the heavens and speak to me. And he has. He's spoken to us through his word. This is how he speaks to us today. Pastor Josh and myself, we were talking about it yesterday. How many Christians say, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. God told me to do this, that, or the third. You, we don't find that that often today. Many people, they take that, and it seems as if God forgets what he's commanded people to do. 
Because we take our orders from God through His Word. Look to the Word of God. That's why the most important thing for Paul to tell his son is to stick to the Word. Stick to the Word. Don't stick to our ideas. Don't stick to opinions. Don't stick to hobbies or psychology or philosophy. Preach the Word of God. Preach the Word of God. Then he tells them to be ready in season and be ready out of season. We know for agriculture, there's a season of mangoes and there's not a season of mangoes. Uh, there's a season when this is in harvest and when this is out of harvest. And we live in a day and age when the Word of God, it's not really in season. People aren't really looking for it. People, they are offended constantly by the Word of God. Even Christians, so-called Christians, you give them the truth of God's Word. When it comes to if the roles of a husband and a wife, the truth of marriage, the truth of sex, the truth of women being pastors, all of these different things, they get offended by the Word of God. Now, should we stop preaching the truth of God's Word? Should we water down the message? Not at all, because we are to preach in season and out of season. At all times, whether it is convenient and when it is not convenient. When someone is going through death and pain, it's very convenient to bring God's comforting words. It's convenient, it's easy to bring the comfort of God's word. But when someone's in sin, when someone's living a lie, when you have a brother or sister that's gossiping, instead of going and doing Matthew 18, it's not so convenient. But we need to preach and teach the truth of God's word. Whether it leads to danger, whether it leads to safety, whether it leads to being in prison or out of prison, we need to teach God's word. And this is not just for pastors. This is for every man here, every woman here. Within your home, you should be teaching the word of God. Jesus tells us the wise man builds his house on the rock. And the wise man is the man who not only hears God's word, but he does it. He applies it. We need to apply God's word. Then he tells them, what does God's word do? It reproves, it rebukes, it exhorts, and we need to rebuke, reprove, and exhort with great patience and instruction. God's messenger is not to just give God's word to meditate on. God's word isn't to just give God's word so we could just think about it, so we could ponder on it so that we can just think in big fluffy terms no God's word is meant to go out and accomplish action in our lives is God's word causing action in your life is it causing you to cling to what is good and to abhor what is evil is God's word stirring in you to become a better man or woman after God's own heart God's Word is not just meant for us to sit in our minds. It's to be in our minds, in our hearts, and then brought out in action. It's all action that God's Word should create. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, I love this verse talking about God's Word. He says, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Once again, God's Word, it brings action. Fire, it brings action. You get close to it, you're warm. You get too close to it, you get burned, right? It creates a place where we can cook, a place that purges, a place that brings light into our lives. God's word is to bring action. God's word is also like a hammer that breaks our hard hearts, that breaks our sinful desires, that breaks the lies of this world. God's word should bring action in our lives. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us the word of God, it is living, it is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is alive and it's powerful. Just Speak the truth of God's word. Just let it out in difficult situations in your life. I encourage you, read God's word every day as much as you can. 
To read God's Word throughout the year, to read the whole Bible in a year, takes about 10 to 15 minutes of reading a day. Maybe max 30 minutes of reading if you're a bad reader like me. But you could read through the whole Bible in a year. And each day you will find out God's Word will bring something out that applies to today. It's alive. It's living. And it's to cause reproof, rebuke, and exhortation. That word reprove, it's to convict someone, to find someone guilty. And each of us, we've been found guilty. All of humanity, we've been found guilty. Guilty of our sins, guilty of our trespasses. Each of us deserve hell for all of eternity. We have been found guilty. And then it's another difficult thing. God's word is to rebuke us. That is to criticize sharply. It's when someone examines and judges as a critic, someone searching for faults within someone else. And maybe that doesn't sound so kind, but a good teacher, a good coach examines you, critiques you, and gives you the truth. A good coach, a good teacher says, hey, you're doing well in these areas, but this is where you're lacking. Go and do this. Go and work on this. And God's Word, it looks at our lives and it examines, it judges, and it says, okay, are you going to work on these areas of sin and of destruction in your life? And then finally, God's Word is to exhort us. That is to influence by words or advice, to urge strongly, to encourage someone to a greater course, a greater activity, and to strengthen someone else. When we go through difficult seasons, God's word, it can, encourage us. It, it can encourage us. Today, God's word, it encouraged me this morning. Yesterday, God's word, it encouraged me in the evening. God's word, it can encourage us to do more, to be the mighty men of valor, the mighty women after God's own heart. But all of this is to be done with great patience and instruction. As a good father with his children, he has patience, but he has to give his children instruction. This is how we are to share God's word with people. Don't get frustrated the first time you tell someone the, the word of God and they don't accept it. How many of us did it take two times, three times, four times, five times before we came to the truth of God's word? Let's be patient with others. Be patient with unbelievers. Be patient with immature believers be patient with one another. We know that the fruit of the Spirit includes patience or long-suffering. Be patient with your brothers and sisters and be patient with unbelievers as well. Why? Verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul warns of a time when Christians will not endure sound doctrine. And that time, it's today. It's today in Eldoret. It's today in Miami. It's today all over the world. People, they don't like sound doctrine. Instead, they want to find pastors and teachers that teach according to their desires, their own lusts. One commentator, A.R. Fawcett, he says, instead of regarding the will of God, they dislike being interrupted in their lusts by true teachers. In other words, men and women will be lovers of self, lovers of what is evil, lovers, agape love for their own sin and darkness instead of the truth of God's word. They will love their sin and lust so much that they will dislike God interrupting their lifestyle and their habits. This is a great warning to us because if a pastor is the most popular pastor in a city or in a nation, if a pastor is the most popular pastor on social media, it does not mean that they are the most biblical or healthy pastor for you and for your family. 
I, I warn the young adults all the time in Miami, don't go after TikTok theology. Don't go after Instagram theology. Don't go after social media theology. Go after the truth of God's Word. It says that they will have itching ears, that they just like to have teachers who give them more pleasure. We need teachers that give us the truth, not that just give us more pleasure. And we find this in the Old Testament, all the way back in Exodus. Exodus chapter 2, the pastor of the nation of Israel was Moses. And Moses, he's out seeking God on the mountain. And the people, the churchgoers, the Israelites, they lose their patience. And it says, the people gathered to Aaron and they said to Aaron, come and make us gods that will go before us. The nation of Israel, they go to Aaron and they say, give us what we want. Tell us what we want to hear. Give us something that will give us more pleasure. He makes the golden calf. They begin worshiping it. They lose their clothes. They begin having orgies. All of this because they're looking for teachers that give them more pleasure. And it's the same today. Why do people love churches that tell them God wants them to be healthy and wealthy? Because who doesn't want to be healthy and wealthy? Who doesn't want to have good health? Who doesn't want to have a fancier car or nicer clothes or a bigger house? Everyone wants that. But that's not the truth of God's word. Our king, while he was here, he, tell, he, he warned a man that wanted to come and follow him. He told him, foxes have holes, but the son of man, he has nowhere to lay his head. The birds of the air, they have nests, but I don't even have a home here. Be careful if you want to come and seek me and follow me. It tells us they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. They'll turn aside from the truth of God creating the heavens and the earth. They'll turn aside to evolution or aliens being what put us here on this planet. They'll turn aside the truth of God creating one man to leave his father and mother to be joined to his wife to create the fables of sexual promiscuity, pornography, same-sex attraction, same-sex marriage, they will turn aside to fables. In Romans chapter 1, there are many warnings there. We won't look at all of it this, at this morning service. We looked at all of it. But in verse 22 of Romans chapter 1, it says, Professing to be wise, they became fools. This is because they knew the truth of God. But they wanted to push back and push back and push back and they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. We have to be careful because we're at church. So many of us, we think we're pretty awesome. We're pretty good people because I attend church. But often we can turn aside from the truth of God's word to fables even though we are at church. David Guzik, he gives a few different fables that Christians and churchgoers turn to. One fable is that you must earn your way before God. That it's not enough to just cry out to God, repent of our sins, confess by faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and has died for our sins. If you've done that, you're justified before God. You've been adopted as a son and a daughter to God. You don't have to do anything else to earn His favor or earn His acceptance. You've been accepted. The other fable is that God only loves you when you're good. Oftentimes we struggle, we go through conviction or more so condemnation when we're not doing as much as we should be doing for God. Now conviction is good, it stirs us up to do more for God. Condemnation, it just causes us to shrink down, to stop going to church, to stop being with God's people because we think God doesn't love me right now because I'm not being obedient to Him. No, God loves you and that's probably why He's disciplining you and chastening you and trying to bring you back to Him. The last fable is that you should walk around 
thinking of yourself as better than other people because you are a Christian. We need to be humble. We need to be loving. We need to look at the world around us and have a love for them. Not a love of the world, but a love for the lost. Then he tells them in verse 5, but you. Paul does this all throughout 1st and 2nd Timothy. He tells Timothy, there are these men that have left the faith, but you, Timothy. There are these men that they're in the ministry only for, the, for their own money, but you, Timothy. And here today, God, he's looking to you and he's saying, you are to be different than this world. You have been called to be different. You are to be holy as he is holy. You're not to look for the Christian that's doing the most sinful things and be consistent with them. You are to be holy as God himself is holy. We are called to be different. There are men and women looking for pastors and teachers that will give them more pleasure, but you, Timothy. Instead of seeking after pleasure, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. We've been called to wake up and to pay attention as someone who is completely sober in all occasions and in all circumstances. We need to pay attention. John Calvin, he said, the more determined men become to despise the teachings of Christ, the more zealous should godly ministers be to assert it, and the more strenuous their efforts to preserve it entirely. The more our world mocks the word of God, the more God's people should rise up and be zealous and hungry for the truth of God's word. Family, do not allow anything to cloud your judgment. Don't allow anything to slow you down. Don't be drunk with liquor. Don't be drunk with pride. Don't be drunk with bad doctrine. Don't allow the fear of man to cloud your judgment. God's word tells us the fear of man, it brings a snare. It is a trap. If you live your life always consumed with what do they think? What's their opinion? What will they think of me? You will live a life with very little joy. But it tells us the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God leads to knowledge. The fear of God is the beginning of understanding. The fear of God, it is pure and it keeps his people. We need to make our decisions not based on what people think or even at times what our own families think. We need to make our decisions saying, I respect God more than everyone else. I revere God more than my wife or my children or my own family because I would not have my wife or my children or my family if it were not for God himself. Paul has called Timothy to the stand and charged him, pay careful attention to your life and pay careful attention to, the, to share the gospel and to fulfill your ministry. He tells him to endure affliction, to endure hardship. And around our world, there is a growing love for comfort. A growing love for comfort. It is one of the biggest idols I see within the Church of America. I'm sure it's no different here. Do whatever is most comfortable. I, I don't feel like sharing the gospel. I'm scared, so I'm not going to do it. I don't feel like going to church today, so I'm not going to do it. That's not comfortable, so I'm not going to do it. it. It's become a God. We need to endure difficulties. Life will be difficult. Jesus has promised us that in this world there will be tribulation. But what does he tell us? But fear not, for I have overcome the world. We will have difficulties in this world. Be ready for it. Be that strong soldier. Be that strong warrior for the things of God. He commands Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And this is for all mankind. Jesus' last words to his disciples were to go out into the world and share the gospel, preach the gospel, baptizing men, baptizing women. That's our call. If you're saying you're going to heaven when you die, your job is to share the gospel and to follow after Jesus Christ. It's not just for pastors and church leaders. 
It's not just if you have the gift of evangelism. I encourage you, share the truth of God's word with people, with friends, with family, with coworkers, with people that you're walking with, people on the bus. Share the gospel with one another. Do that work of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. That's all we need to do when we share the gospel. Don't be belligerent. Don't be screaming at them, foaming at the mouth, angry with them. Just speak the truth of God in love. Finally, he tells Timothy to fulfill his ministry. Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Leave nothing undone. And for each and every one of us, there are things we have undone right now in what God has called us to do. What has God told you to do in this season? What do you sense his word impressing upon your heart? Has he called you to cut off a friendship? To stop a relationship because it's leading you away from him? Has he called you to start serving at church more or or attending church more regularly? Fulfill that ministry. Has he called you to teach the children? Has he called you to help clean the church? Fulfill your ministry. Leave nothing undone. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. God loves to take us where we are at and take what we're working on and use it for the glory of God. When Moses was fearful about going back to Egypt and telling Pharaoh to let my people go, God tells, Mo- God tells Moses, what's in your hand? And all he had was his shepherd's staff. All he had was the rod, and God used that. For David, he was a shepherd, and he played the harp, and God used that. W- what do you have in your hand? Are you using it with all your might for the glory of God? Not for your own money, not for your own comfort, not to bring a greater name for you and your family, Are you doing it for the glory of God? Paul encourages Timothy to do all that God has asked of him to do. Timothy did not have to look exactly like Paul. Timothy didn't have to dress exactly like Paul or teach just like Paul or do exactly what Paul did. No, God had a specific plan and a specific ministry for Timothy. And it's the same for us, family. God has a specific ministry for you. He has a ministry for you, for you to reach certain people, for you to encourage and love certain people that I will never be able to reach, that Pastor Josh, Pastor Peter will never be able to reach. And that's why each of us need to fulfill our own ministry. We need to do it with all of our might. Are you in school right now? Fulfill your ministry. Are you at work? Fulfill your ministry. Cleaning at the church? Fulfill your ministry. Teaching at at the church? Fulfill your ministry. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 warns us. He says, For who has despised the day of small things? And sometimes our pride creeps in and says, I should be doing something greater than what I'm doing right now. I'm meant for so much more. I'm stuck at home watching these small children. There's more in this life for me. I'm stuck right now having to do cleaning work, cleaning the bathrooms. I should be doing more. But do you know why David was ready to lead God's people and be a great king? Because he was faithful to his father's few sheep. He was faithful to protect the sheep from the lion and from the bear. This week I saw many lions. We went out to the Masa and we saw many lions. I would not wrestle any lion for any sheep. And yet David was faithful to protect his father's sheep. He didn't see it as something beneath him or below him. What are you doing right now? Do it with all your might. Be faithful to it. And God, in his timing, he will raise you up to do more. And if he doesn't, glory be to God. Fulfill your ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And family, this is the only thing that God will judge us on, is our faithfulness. 
He's not going to judge us based on numbers. He's going to judge us on faithfulness. Hey, were you faithful with the talents that I gave you? Were you faithful to that family I put you in? Were you faithful in the church that I put you in? All we have to do is be found faithful. Not measuring up to other men or measuring up to other women. Be faithful to the ministry that God has put you in. We're not going to please everyone. Everyone's not going to be happy with us. Once again, the fear of man, it's a snare. It's a life with very little joy. Very little joy. But if you're seeking after God, if your whole life is about pleasing your king, you will be fulfilled and you'll have joy in this life and in the next. Paul ends in verse 6 through 8. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul is writing this down as an absolute champion, as an absolute warrior. He's not worried about death. He's not scared of execution. His life has long been a living sacrifice, Romans 12.1. And now if God sees it fit to bring him home, Paul's saying, I fought the good fight. I've run my race. I've kept the faith. And this is the key for us. If we're faithful to the ministry, to the calling God has put in our life, we will not have regret at the end of our life. Think of the life of Paul, a man who once took Christians and broke up families. A man that would once put pressure on people to dishonor the name of God. A a man that put other believers to death is able to say here, I have no regrets I'm ready to see my judge and my king. And it's because Paul's telling Timothy, be faithful to your ministry. And Paul's at the end of his life saying, I've done it. I've been faithful to the ministry. I've done what God has called me to do. And I encourage you that you'd be able to have that. That you'd have a life without regret. Because you're being faithful to not just be a hearer of God's word, but to be a doer of God's word. You're taking the truth of God's word and you're applying it to your life and allowing it to bring action into your life. So let's pray and then Pastor Josh will come up and close us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word, God, how it shows us how to be godly men. It shows the women how to be godly ladies. It shows us how to be a good father, how to be a good mother. Lord, how your word, it has everything for us, Lord. We thank you for the love that you have for us. And Father, if anyone is here and they just feel the condemnation of the devil, perhaps they have a past, a sinful past, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them that just as you changed the life of Saul and transformed him into Paul, Lord, how you want to transform their life, how they can leave the sin and the worry and all of the disgust of this world behind and they can cling to you and have a life of peace and grace and joy so lord we love you thank you for the gift of the church body thank you for the gift of your word and lord thank you for the gift of your son jesus christ it's in his name that we pray amen Amen. thank you